Yes. So welcome back. I just would like to remind you to be on time. We are ruthless here. Uh, so and leave a bit of time before uh, the end for questions. I will be waiting. Okay. okay so Luai Nakle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll be on time and feel free to yell at me. We yell in the Middle East. This is how it works. So I will be, I'll be giving a talk here about a new work that we have done on what we call divide and conquer approaches for, for inference of phylogenetic networks for large scale data sets. So first, what is a phylogenetic network? We have heard one talk about that. The topology of a phylogenetic network is a rooted directed acyclic graph. This is the type of I'm interested in. It has two, two types of nodes, tree node that has in degree one, and it has reticulation nodes that have n-degree 2. The reticulation nodes, these do, nodes with n-degree 2, correspond to hybridization events, horizontal gene transfer, and so on. I'm interested in statistical inference of these. So these, are, these topologies are also parameterized. So we have, for example, here with every node, associated with every node, there's divergence time, the time at which this, this speciation or hybridization happen, and so on. Also, with, along with every branch in this phylogenetic network, there is a population size and uh, population size, and sometimes it is given as a branch length in some other units. So this is what a phylogenetic network is. Of course, it can get much more complicated than this. The number of, of nodes of n-degree 2 is, is, in theory, infinite, actually. You can keep adding them because times, uh, times are associated with nodes. Why do we care about phylogenetic networks? There are lots of papers that have appeared many, many years ago and continue to appear about hybridization and introgression and the role of the, that this play in, in uh, speciation and adaptation of species and so on. Here are some examples of very recent papers showing talking about hybridization in wheat, and plants, hybridization in, in mice, hybridization in mosquitoes. Of course, there are hybridization in, uh, in primates. There is a famous story about human, Neanderthal, all these, all these kind of examples fit within the framework of a phylogenetic network. So from a statistical perspective, we look at these phylogenetic networks as a generative process and think about it again as in the case of that uh, when Erin was giving a talk, the only difference between this and what, what Erin was talking about is that here I have a network instead of a species tree. So we have species network. Within the branches of this network, you can imagine that there's a set of trees growing there. Each one of these trees belongs to one region in the genome or one locus. 
And along the branches of every gene tree, a set of sequences is evolving there. Okay? So if we go from the network, the topology plus its parameters, divergence times, population size, and so on, this can, you can actually generate a set of trees from that. On each tree, plus a Markovian model for sequence evolution, you can generate sequences. Now, of course, the inference problem is going bottom up, right? I mean, for the inference problem, we have the sequence data, and we want to get to the network. Okay? So the statistical inference of phylogenetic network in this, the, the, the version of the problem I'm talking about is that the input consists of M sequence alignments. So you have M sequence alignments, one for every locus. So in this case, we have M loci that you can collect from the, across the genome. There are important assumptions in our case mathematically about these loci. First is that these loci are independent for the ma mathematical convenience here. And the second thing is that within a locus, within a sequence alignment, there is no recombination. It is assumed there is no recombination. And the output that we are interested in is the phylogenetic network topology, all the branch lengths, divergence times, population, mutation rates, plus the inheritance probabilities. These are probabilities that tell us about basically the proportions of the genomes inherited through hybridization. This is the main formula that appears in any statistical inference of these networks in this, in this area, where basically we are talking about what this basically says here is that if you look at G as the gene tree, S as a sequence alignment and psi as a species network, we have to account for the probability of sequences coming down the gene tree and the probability of the gene tree evolving down the phylogenetic network. So this is a formula that is central to statistical inference of phylogenetic networks under what we call the multi-species network coalescent. So this formulation allows us not only to account for hybridization and reticulation in general, but also allows us to, to account for incomplete lineage sorting and these kind of processes that result in incongruence. So how hard is this problem, statistical uh, inference? This is, I'm showing actually, this figure is from a paper that we had in ISMB last year. What I'm showing you here, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we looked at, for example, a network with 20 taxa, 20 leaves in this network, and we looked at the likelihood calculation on this network with just one reticulation node versus the likelihood calculation on a tree. So when we just delete this one of these two edges, it becomes a tree. So we look at the calculation of the likelihood of the network versus a tree. What this figure is showing you is that the amount of time it takes to compute the likelihood of a network with one reticulation increases by seven orders of magnitude over the calculation of a tree. So this is not a trivial problem that a network with one reticulation is just a tree plus one more edge. Yes, it looks like that, but computationally, the amount of computation can increase by, by seven orders of magnitude for 20 taxa. This can get much, much worse if you have larger data sets. So what do we do in this work? Divide and conquer approach. The approach basically takes the standard uh, uh, route for, for divide and conquer. The first thing is that we divide the set of taxa, the set of species. So, so if you have in, in species, we divide them into subsets of species. Unlike the work that Erin described in the, morning, in the early afternoon, uh, here the set of species are overlapping because we want to combine the networks that we get from that. Then we infer a network on each one of these subsets. For that one, we do the, ex the, the, the computationally expensive but accurate analysis using Bayesian inference. And then the last step, of course, we combine these subnetworks that we get. Okay. So in the current version, <coughs> uh, and this is not a limitation, we just chose it for this paper, we focus on all subsets of three taxa. Okay, so we look at the network with n taxa, you divide it into all n choose three subsets and infer what we call trinets, a network on three taxa. So if you have n taxa, you have n choose three trinets that you infer first. And these trinets are given by their topologies and times that are estimated from the sequence data directly. And then we want to merge them. Of course, the, the, the non-trivial part here is merging these ones because the other ones, we are not doing anything fancy. We are just saying, look at every a subset of three taxa, infer a network using methods that have been developed, but then how do we merge them? Okay. So the merger algorithm is really what we, are try what we are interested in. So suppose you have someone has inferred these trinets, networks on three taxa, 
And we want to get from that to the full network. So these trinets there, these are every possible trinet on three taxa, A, A, B, C, D, E. So this is A, B, A, B, C, A, B, D, A, B, E, and so on. These are all the trinets. If you look at there are horizontal dotted line that shows the times for the internal nodes, for example, here. So we have the topologies plus the times. And we want to get to this. Of course, what I'm showing here is that this is the ideal situation where I know the true trinets and all of that, and I want to get to, to, to the network. This is, never happens in practice. In practice, what you have is inferred trinets. So these are trinets that we inferred from sequence data. These trinets are not accurate, of course, because of issues with the, with the limit of the data, the, the, the issues with the method that was used, not only in terms of the estimates of the times, but also in terms of the topology of the trinet itself might not be accurate. So the way the algorithm, again, at a very high level, the details are, of course, in the paper. The first the thing we do with this uh, in terms of, the, of, of um, merging the trinets, the first thing we do is we go through the trinets, we find equivalent or isomorphic nodes in these trinets, and then we reconcile their times. So for example here, if you look at the first trinet on the left, and if you look at the, the first trinet here on the right, the green node in both of them, these are counterparts in these trinets, they came with two different times here, estimated times. The reason for that is that because of the data, you know, we are running again a heuristic here, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and so on. So we don't want that. We don't want that one trinet is telling us one time for this node and another one is telling us another one. So the first thing we do is we reconcile the trinet's times. So we find, algorithmically, we find all these nodes that are equivalent. We take the average of their times and we assign that average to all such that all the green nodes will have exactly the same time. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing is that we derive a global distance matrix from that. So it's a five by five. In this case, we have five taxa. If you have n taxa, it's an n by n matrix. But if you look at every entry in this matrix, it's not one entry. It's now a list of distances. Why? Because if I look, for example, at BD here, BD in some trinets could have two ancestors in the network. So now we are not talking about a tree. In a tree, everything is easier than a network because if you take any two taxa in a tree, they have a unique least common ancestor. With a network, you can have multiple common ancestors because of multiple paths. So this is what you see here is a list of these times. So we have a list of three times for C to D. So C and D coalesce three different times based on different trinets. So we first get this network, we get this matrix. This is the second step of the algorithm. Then the third step is that we want to find, we identify what we call a backbone network. So of all the trinets, we want to get to choose one that we select as a starting point for building the large network. And once we select that, we have a network now on three taxa. That leaves us with n minus three taxa that we need to add to that network. So we also look, we compute an order for how to add these. So now we have A, D, E missing our B and C. We need to know which one to add first. Is it B or C? So for that, we build the graph, a directed graph, based on the information, the, the partial order that comes from the trinets. We do topological sort on this. And based on the topological sort, we start adding these nodes one by one. So topological sort here, if we ignore A, D, E, because they are included, it tells us that B comes before C. So the first thing the algorithm is going to do is going to find the right placement for B in this. And then it adds C. This is the part of the algorithm that I cannot describe due to, to time limitations here, but in the, the way it, it's actually a very detailed heuristic for how to find these times because it looks at multiple points and assesses them based on some criterion, topological criterion, and then it finds the places based on, again, optimizing certain criterion. And then at the end, again, so the merge part of this algorithm is not really what we are used to in the divide and conquer where you take all the subsolutions and merge them into one. It's really incremental building of the large network, but based on the subsolutions. Okay, so if we have the trinet on three, then we add the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. The order is determined deterministically from, from the, the data, and then we stick with that. The merger algorithm, we don't have any theoretical guarantees on this. We don't have any theorem and proof that says this algorithm is, is correct. 
but we do uh, experiments here where we generated, for example, 10,000 networks with 17 tags. So we generated 100 uh, networks with 41 and 100 with 81. These numbers, the one, is because we usually choose an outgroup. So it's really 80, 40, and 16. And these networks were generated under a birth-death hybridization model. So these are very, very uh, random and have some realism from a biological po point of view. What we feed, we take every network, we split it into all its trinets, we feed it to the merger algorithm. What we show you here is that in the case of 81 taxa for all 100 networks, once you feed it the trinets, it, the algorithm gives you, in all, in all 100 cases, gives you the correct network. Nothing added, nothing missing. This, for the 41, it's 98%, 98%. There is no reason to, again, to question why 41, it doesn't get it, 81 gets This is just stochasticity here. Okay. So the algorithm does very, very well in practice if you feed it the true trinets. Okay. So this basically tells us that the algorithm is fine, is good, if the data is, is fine. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the number of trinets all in choose three, this is not a simple thing because this number starts growing. It's, of course, it's on, on the order of n cubed, but on the order of n cubed is not a good thing for, for us when we're doing statistical uh, analysis. I will show you now very soon why. So now we have n choose three on the order of n cubed. Not all of them are needed. Another contribution of the paper is that we formulate a version of the problem where we can reduce the number of trinets that we need to build. It's actually of some simple version, some nice version of the hitting set problem. We implement a solution and we minimize, we reduce the number of trinets. So here what we, what we get, for example, is that we go from, from uh, 80,000 or 800,000 to 347 trinets that we need to build. So we actually reduce the number of trinets we need to build in, in, in two orders of magnitude. Of course, it comes at the expense of accuracy, and this is a step we are looking into here. How do we reduce the number of trinets without affecting tr uh, accuracy much? So here we went from, from 100% to 88% accuracy. Here we went from 98 to 83. So we lose 10 to 15% in accuracy, but we reduce the number of trinets significantly. So again, in reality, you never have the true trinets. So the question is that how does this work in practice when you try to infer the trinets? To look at that, we, we did simulation study where we generate the actual data sequence data. Then we have 24 different networks with different, what we call hardness here, some easy, some very hard. And for each one of these networks, we simulate, uh, we simulate uh, gene trees and sequences and so on. For each one of these 24 networks, if you feed it the true trinets, for e every one of these cases, the algorithm gives you the, t the correct network. So the question is that what happens when you run the method fully? Okay, so when you start estimating these trinets and so on. So here we simulated the sequence data and then we inferred the trinets using a, a Bayesian method that will infer these, uh, these trinets with their divergence times and so on. But this is one important thing actually I want to highlight here. If you take one network with 680 trinets, even though they are networks on three taxa, it takes about 1,600 hours to estimate that. So statistical inference is very expensive even on small, on small data sets. Now the nice thing is that these trinets are independent, you can infer them, but you're not gonna kill 680 taxa, maybe you have access to a cluster with 680 machines, but when you have 80,000 and you start going into millions, that's not a good solution. So here, this is the accuracy of the, of the inferred trinets themselves. What I'm showing here, if you look at the blue is good, we're getting the trinet correctly. Uh, orange is that we are not getting it correctly, but almost correctly, again, without getting into the details. Uh, gray is that when we get a, net, a trinet, that's complete, almost completely wrong. Okay? So what this shows here for the letters E on the x-axis here, these are the easy cases. All the trinets almost get, cor get inferred uh, correctly. When you go to the medium complexity networks, we get it in most cases, the trinets. When we go to the hard cases, so some networks are very, very hard, that even the trinets in, in some of the cases, we don't get them correctly. Okay? So this is expected. And this is the accuracy of the trinets themselves. The question is that when we put them together, we see also good performance on the easy ones. And for the challenging ones, we see that the error in the trinets is going to translate into error, of course, in the large network that we infer. Okay. 
Running time of this method, again, asymptotically, it is quadratic in the number of reticulations. That's usually, this is three, four, five, so this is not bad. It's, uh, it's uh, quadratic in the number of trinets, and it is polynomial in the number of taxa, but how does it perform in practice? For 81 taxa, if you use the full data set of trinets, it takes about 1,000 seconds. If you use the reduced uh, set of trinets, it's just 10 seconds on 81 taxa. Okay. This is uh, implemented, available in Philonet. For future directions, we are interested still in doing better job at reducing the number of trinets and how to, how to, co to, to combine them in a better way. And with that, thank you very much. Corresponding, oh, how do you, do you ensure? That, how do you find the corresponding nodes? I mean, just that in a network is not. Yeah, yeah. So the question is that how do we find the corresponding nodes in these trinets so that we average their times? So please keep in mind that these are networks on three taxa. So the way we do it is that we split now the network on three taxa into three different binets. So the three networks on two taxa. So now we look at the, there are two leaves only, so the, the correspondence it becomes trivial, and then we find some some sort of isomorphism among these nodes. Okay, but if it was a bigger bigger network, it would that would alone would be yes. More so that becomes also challenging. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, one brief question: So how do your networks, your computed networks, behave regarding the optimal hybridization number? So the minimum hybridization number. So have you checked that? So how, do, how do the networks compare with, with the minimum number of hybridization? Yeah, right. We don't actually, this is not a parsimony approach here. We don't go after the minimum. This is a statistical approach. So the Bayesian method itself, through model complexity modeled in the prior itself, it decides on the number of reticulations. So whenever we show that the network is correct, it means also it has the correct number of reticulations. But we don't try to minimize the number of reticulations. So I forgot, how, how do you dis determine the order of adding the nodes, adding the taxa? So the order, order how do we determine the order of adding the, the taxa to the, to the backbone network? Yeah. So the first thing is that we, look, we, build, we build a, a directed graph based on the trinets themselves. So every trinet is a partial order on the taxa, right? So which one comes before which? In terms of the times, they have times with them. So we build a, we build a directed graph on that, we do topological sort and use that. 